I would love for you to turn with me in your Bibles or on your smartphone, which doesn't really count as a Bible, <laughs> to John chapter 21. Reading from God's Word. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called Did Didymus, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in, it came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and a fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread, gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Lord Jesus, we, uh, we thank you for your word, the privilege of holding your word in our hands. And now I pray that you would speak to us through this broken man, hide me behind your cross. And the things that you have to say to us may be because of or in spite of the words that are heard. We worship you, we love you, we adore you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you were to Google the word privilege, it would show this setting right now, the opportunity to be with all of you. I've heard a lot about you. I've never actually been on your campus. I tried one time to meet with Mike, and that was probably seven or eight years ago, but the snow... <laughs> I don't even need to finish that sentence, do I? <laughs> the snow kept me from getting here. So I slept in the lodge last night. There's a little name thing on the door, and I'm working on getting actually a permanent name tag on that door. I want that room. I want that room, Sue. So thank you for inviting me to be here and the privilege of standing in front of you. Thank you for your ministry. I've uh, gotten to know some of you. There was a conference in, uh, in Orlando, which is my home, a month ago and had the joy of meeting with some of you. So it's great to be here. Now this, um, this chapter, chapter 21, I've, I've actually, and I, all of you teach, most of you teach, many of you teach, and somebody says, here's what I'd like, where, where I'd like you to speak, and you say, I have no idea what I'm going to do, and so the Lord sort of brings something to you. So this is brand new. I've never taught from this, but uh, opened my Bible, and the Lord said, this is where you ought to just spend a few minutes with your friends at Revive Our Hearts Life Action Ministry. So that's what we're going to do. But the, the interesting thing about chapter 21 is that it begins with after these things. Now, you know, if, if, when you read the Pauline epistles, they often start with the word therefore, right? And so you've heard people say, well, what's therefore, therefore? And so you've got to go back and find out what the therefore is referring to, right? What's therefore, therefore? And so it's, somebody has said it'd be a great exercise to read the Bible backwards because there's so much that's sort of in our last episode, right? So this says after these things. And then if you go back to chapter 20, the Apostle John comes in for a landing. Look at the last two verses of chapter 20. This sounds like the end of his gospel. 
And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Now, wouldn't you love to know? I mean, someday we will, but it just sort of tantalizes with, it's not in the book, other miracles that Jesus did. And then verse 31, <clears throat> but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The end. Well, not quite. The Apostle John had a little bit more work to do. It, you know, it's, it's, and that's not all infomercial kind of stuff, right? There's one more thing we need to do. So he goes on to chapter 1, or 21, and has a few more things to say. And at the end of the day, this chapter, chapter 21, is an epilogue. Sometimes you read a book, and it has an epilogue, and it's sort of a rearview mirror as to what has just happened. But there's some unfinished business, and it really is one of the most important, I think, one of the more important encounters with Jesus in all the Gospels. And, and so what we've just read, I stopped before I got to something that I think is really critically important, but this part is really terrific. Let me just take a look at it. Let's look at it together. So Simon Peter, verse 3, and there were seven disciples named here, two unnamed disciples. We don't know who they are. And John refers, as you know, to himself through his gospel as what? The disciple Jesus loved. He, he doesn't say his own name in his, in his gospel. So this would be the sons of Zebedee, which would be James and John, right? So, but seven of them. And, and what do they do? They go fishing. Now, there, there are some men, I don't fish, but I know some men, this is their life verse, right? <laughs> Let's go fishing. They have a, a little plaque. And so they go fishing. And you think, well, why did they do that? Well, that's what they knew how to do. That was their vocation. And just imagine the trauma they had just been through, right? The, the Gethsemane encounter with the soldiers, Jesus praying, the trial, the crucifixion, the resurrection, a couple visits with Jesus. But can you, can you sort of see the, the emotion building in their hearts? And so what do they do? They do something familiar. They go fishing. In 1987, I was working for a company called Thomas Nelson Publishers in Nashville. I had left a company in Waco, Texas called Word Publishing and taken a job as the president of Thomas Nelson. I got a call one day, absolutely perfectly timed. Have you had calls like that? You say, Lord, how did you know? Well, I guess I know how you knew, but I needed this call. And it was from my former boss. So I had left his company to join his competitor. He had no reason to call me at all. But I was frozen up. Have you ever been frozen up? I mean, you look at your desk, and it might as well be crying babies and you don't know what to do. You're frozen up, and that is exactly how I felt. And I got this call. This is before caller ID, so I didn't know who it was. And when he said my name, I just, I wept. It was like, Lord, you have just shown up in the voice of this man whom I love. And he said, what's up? And I said, Doc, I'm frozen up. I can't move. My desk is covered with things to do. And I don't know what to do. Have you ever been there? You don't know what to do. You're frozen up. Now, you know, I don't know if it was a nervous breakdown or at the threshold of a nervous breakdown, but it was really a hard moment. I'll never forget how that felt. So I explained to him. Now, remember, he is my number one competitor, and I'm his number one competitor. He has no business helping me out. He should have said, great. I love the sound of that. I hope you never unfreeze. I want to beat you at your game. But he didn't. And so he said to me, all right, first of all, he, he encouraged me. He said, look, I have great confidence in you, all those you know, things that bosses say sometimes to their employees. And then he said, when we hang up, I want you to turn around and look at your desk, and I want you to scan it, and I want you to find one thing you can do right now. Forget, how, forget the stack, the mounds, the stuff. Look for one thing to do now. If I had been on the phone with Byron Paulus, he would have said, let me pray with you before you turn around and look at your desk. But Doc didn't do that. And that's what I did. I hung up, I thanked him, hung up, turned around and scanned my desk, and I saw one thing that I could do. 
can't tell you how healing it was to, to be able to do one thing, right? Is any, do you understand this? Does this make sense? Yes, yes. Well, here's Peter as the spokesman for these seven disciples. And he says, you know what? I'm frozen up. I've just been through this incredibly terrorizing experience. What am I going to do? I'm going to look at my desk. I'm going to say, I know how to fish. And so he goes fishing. It's a great, it's a great reminder that when this happens to you and me, rather than being overwhelmed by the amount of work to be done, you say, you know what? There's one thing I know that I can do right now, and you go do it. It, it can be a menial thing. It can be a big thing, a strategic thing, but you do one thing. And that's, that's, what, that's what Simon Peter did. He was, an, he was enough in touch with himself and his own heart to say, I'm going to go do something. So he goes fishing. I love that picture. So guess what happened? I mean, I guess that's why they call it fishing rather than catching. But they spent the night fishing. That's what they knew how to do. And they were completely unsuccessful, right? And so morning dawns, and they see a person on the shore, and they hear a voice, right? When morning had come, this is verse 4, they did not know it was Jesus. Now, is that kind of a mystery to you? Why didn't they know? They'd been with him for three years. Why didn't they recognize his profile or recognize his voice. Do you wonder about that? Do you remember Luke 24? Two men walking to Emmaus. Doesn't that remind you of that? And they're walking with Jesus, and they're troubled. And this person walking with them says, why are you troubled? And they say, it's kind of insulting, isn't it? They say, are you the only person that doesn't, in Jerusalem that doesn't know what's just happened? Jesus is very patient with them. I would, wouldn't, wouldn't you love to have been there for Jesus to summarize the whole Old Testament? I would love to have that, like in a pamphlet or something, to read it, a blog post. And when they get, this is verse 31 of chapter 24 of Luke, when they get to where they're going, they invite Jesus for lunch, and then they have prayer for lunch. You remember this? And what does Jesus do? He breaks the bread after the prayer. And then what does the scripture say? Then their eyes, listen, were opened. Then their eye, it doesn't say, and then they opened their eyes. There's a big difference between, and their eyes were opened, and they opened their eyes. We have no capability of knowing who he is unless he gives us the spirit that gives us the opportunity to know who he is and recognize him. So these men saw Jesus on the shore. They heard his voice. And he hadn't yet empowered them to know who it was. For by grace you've been saved through faith, right? It takes grace and faith, and then it says, and that not of yourselves. So in case you and I say, well, I'm a believer because, you know, I heard a sermon, I read a book, and came to Jesus. No, no, no. You were drawn. 1 John 4.19. The only way we love him is why? Because he first loved us. I love, somebody said amen. God bless you. So, and then Jesus calls them children. Really? These are grown men. These guys are probably daddies and maybe granddaddies, and he calls them children. I love that. John uses that a lot in his epistles, doesn't he? Little children, little children. Doesn't that remind you of what Jesus said it takes to come to him? Makes no mistake about it. Come as children. Love that. Have you any food? And they said, they answered him and said, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat. Now, is that a familiar moment? John chapter 5. He did the same thing. And it's interesting because that took, that filled two boats, and we don't have a count. I love this one. Martin Jones must have been around for this <laughs> to make sure that he knew exactly how many fish. That's that's one of the things he does, right? But in John 5, the nets break. These nets didn't break. And what did Peter do when he realized what Jesus just, had just done? Remember? He fell on his face and said to Jesus, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. So this is, this is a rabbit 
so I won't, but I won't have, I don't have time to chase it. But three years had passed. <clears throat> was he less of a sinful man three years later? No. But he had had three years of, of understanding the grace of God through his son Jesus. And so instead of, instead of falling on his knees and saying, depart from me, I'm a sinful man, what did he do? Well, he put on his garment. This is an interesting thing, because usually when you jump in the water, you go the other way, right? So I don't even want to go there thinking about what he may have had on or not had on before his robe. We could, we don't have, it's too early in the morning to talk about stuff. <laughs> but he jumped in the water, and he swam to Jesus, because he had a different picture of grace three years after the first experience of Jesus filling his nets with fish. Is that a wonderful thought? It is, amen. So, <laughs> cast the net on the right side of the boat, you'll find that. They, so they cast, and the nets were filled. Or the net was filled. Therefore, verse 7, that disciple who we're talking about now, John, who wrote these words under the power of the Holy Spirit, said to Peter, it is the Lord. I love that. He said, Peter, get a life, get a grip. It's the Lord. And that's when Peter put on something and dove in the water and swam to Jesus. And then verse 8, I mean, somebody's got to get the, the boat to the shore, right? Is it, the, Peter is, he jumps in the water and like, so like, what about the other six guys and the fish? Peter really doesn't care about that. Peter cares sort of about his experience with Jesus, and so he jumps in the water. I love that. Uh, they came in from the boat, 200 cubits, that's about 100 yards. So it's not, they weren't that far. As soon as they came to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. Now, you know, you read, you, you scurry by that when you're reading the scripture and you go, what, 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 what? Really? So, like, these weren't the fish that the guys caught. Jesus had already made breakfast. We know how. But that's, isn't that a great thing? And bread, too. I mean, you can catch fish, there's food, but he had bread there as well. Just, just another miracle, another God sighting. Love that. And then Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have caught. Which is, it's interesting. Does Jesus need us to get his work accomplished? No, he really doesn't. Romans 9. I mean, Last time I checked, Pharaoh wasn't member, a member of a church or in a small group. And God used him. God spoke to a pagan man. God spoke to a pagan man to change the life of his own people. So if he wants to speak to you, he'll speak to you one way or another, right? So, bring some of the fish you've caught. Peter went up, dragged the, land, the, the net to the land full of large fish. Jesus said, come and eat breakfast. Don't you love that? I mean, th think of how much food has to do with fellowship and community. I mean, what, what if the Lord had built us to have to eat once a week or once a month? But we get hungry every four hours or every 15 minutes. <laughs> and what you hear yourself saying is, let's, let's go have lunch together. Let's go have breakfast together. I'll meet you. Just think how often that happens. And so Jesus invites his disciples to sit down with him at breakfast. And, you know, the, the Bible has substantial, about 750,000 words in here. There's a lot that's left out. But... Wouldn't it be fun to know what that conversation was like? Jesus had just performed a miracle. All these fish, they're lying on the shore, probably still flopping around a little bit. And they're talking. Wouldn't it be fun to know exactly what they were talking about? So Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Let me serve you. Let me strengthen you. Let me heal you. Let me forgive you. Then Jesus then came, took the bread, gave it to them, likewise the fish, the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. 
well, there's a little bit more to go here. And it really is one of the more sobering moments in the Gospels. This is an encounter that had to happen before the end of this Gospel. Jesus and Simon Peter had a little chat. Verse 13. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, you know the rest of this, don't you? You folks teach, preach, study, but just put yourself there. And, and Peter has to have sort of this nagging thing inside. Do you know what that is like? You know, when, when you think you've lost something and you can't find it and you've got that grinding thing and it doesn't go away till you find it, right? Or you're in a relationship and the relationship has been broken somehow and you've got that. That's a really good thing, by the way. That's a really good thing to feel like that because you want to do whatever it takes to get rid of that. And so Peter's got this thing. Jesus and he caught eyes the night of Jesus' trial. It says it in the Gospels. Peter denied Jesus three times, just as Jesus had said he would. But we've got some work to do here to get that part fixed, right? And so Jesus looks at Peter and he says, what? Do you love me as much as these? Now, it's interesting because it doesn't unpack these. So what's the antecedent to these? What, what is these, or what, it be, what are these referring to? Well, go ahead and fill in the blank. These, your buddies, your job. Go ahead and you fill that in. Your families, your children, your work, your ministry. Jesus looked at him and said, do you love me more than these? And in fact, the hard part, if you're Simon Peter, is Jesus asked him how many times? Three times. Do you love me more than these? Jesus said, tend to my sheep, feed my sheep. In other words, I love that because he said, now do something as a result of this, like we were saying earlier. Are you, are you traumatized? Are you stuck? Are you frozen up? Do something. So Jesus challenged him to feed the sheep, to tend to the sheep. Uh, this past Palm Sunday... I have no idea why. I really don't. I was actually in the middle of a fast. I've never fasted for three weeks, but I did. And I'm in the, right in the middle of it. And it's Palm Sunday. I'm in Orlando, where I live. I'm at church. Been there before. It's Palm Sunday. All the children came in with their little fronds, right? And I didn't hear a thing. I didn't hear a thing, the pastor said. I've apologized to him since. I didn't hear the music. And here's why. The Lord Jesus was saying to me, do you love me more than these? And I knew the answer. I knew the answer. The answer was no. There's stuff in my life. There's people in my life. May I say, there's a person in my life who I've put on the throne. And so I came back to my home, and I went to my closet, and the Lord spoke to me, and he said, this isn't just a matter of priorities. This is sin. This is sin. If you love anything more than me. Let's call that what it is. And so I confess that. And so a lot of things we could talk about, a lot of rabbits, rabbit trails to chase. But the message that Jesus delivered to Simon Peter is the message for us. And that is, Lord Jesus, only you, only you, deserve the throne. The, the reason really for that, in addition to the fact that he does deserve the throne, is to protect the people and the things that we're tempted to put on the throne. 
if I put anybody or anything else on the throne, I've set them up for failure. They will crush me. They will, they will disappoint me. They will fail me. So pr to protect them, I take them off the throne. Does that make sense? To protect them, I take them off the throne. And so uh, Palm Sunday, 2015, who knows why that happened? The Lord Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, gave me a really serious elbow that morning and said, Robert, everything else goes off the throne. Only I deserve the throne. Do you love me more than these? Well, you know, yes, I do. But I'm going to confess that as sin and, and enjoy the luxury of having the only one on the throne that has a right to be on the throne. So, what an honor to be in his presence and to be reminded that only he deserves that. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, forgive us, forgive me for putting a value on things that have no business being an idol. Only you deserve that position on the throne. And so together, we kneel at your throne. Actually, we kneel at your throne, but someday everyone will kneel at your throne. Every name we read in the newspaper this morning, every name we heard on the news, everyone, everyone will someday kneel before this very same throne. But you've given us the joy of doing that right now. And so we thank you. We ask you, Father, that you would remind us who you are, don't ever let us come casually to this throne. This is holy ground. You are a holy God. And so together we worship you. And the joy of that is because we've together said, and you are our father. You have the right to say, okay, now this is your brother and this is your sister because you share the same father. So we love you. We thank you. I thank you for these precious people in this room and for their hearts for you, their great desire that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So thank you for the call that you've put on all of our lives for that to happen. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. You are good. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.